after what I can only describe as a very full day for everybody, we reach our capstone speaker. And as you know from this morning, we had to make change. Uh, but I'm absolutely delighted to say that Steve Wheeler is with us now and has been for some time, although how he's keeping his eyes open, I'm not too sure, and we much appreciate that. And his wife Dawn, who is with him also. And I think really, at this point in time, there'd be no point in me going through a biog for Steve. Suffice it to say that his background in education is one of the widest ranging I've read between nurse education and teacher training and is now in, uh, involved in health, education and society, which I think is a fascinating coming together of three different areas. So at this point in time, I'd ask you to put your hand together as we welcome Steve Peter. Thank you very much. Have you enjoyed yourself? Yes. We'll soon put a stop to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be here. It's nice to actually be back in Ireland, um, in, in Dublin. This is my third visit. Every time I come here, um, you've got sunny weather. It's always like that, isn't it? I've been told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I bring it. Oh, okay. When I go down to Cork, it's always raining. You know, you know, so, I don't know why, but. Uh, but uh, it, it's nice to be here, and uh, hopefully over the next, um, what, 45 minutes, I hope, maybe less, um, I'll, I'm going to try and talk to you a bit about enhanced learning futures, and whatever that means. And it means a lot of things. Notice I'm using futures plural, because there are lots of different possible futures that we can think about, encounter, envisage, imagine. And I'm going to explore them with you, and, and um, hopefully you'll make your own minds up about what your enhanced learning future is going to be. I was delayed, we were delayed yesterday and we, we, we got stuck in the, uh, the fog, didn't we Dawn? That's Dawn by the way, the front there. If you say hello to her afterwards you'll find out she's a qualified nurse, she's a qualified teacher, she's an expert on knitting, she's an expert on social media, she's published with me. Um, if you press her, she'll even tell you about the day we met each other when she was due to get married to another guy. <laughs> now, I'll let you think about that, okay? And then she can maybe tell you about it. All descend on her afterwards. She's not shy, you know. At all. Anyway, um, here's a bit about me. Um, just for the benefit of those of you who were twittering, that's my Twitter persona over there, T Timbuk Teeth. I want to explain to you now. You can read my blog if you want to know about it. But um, I am as. Um, Adrian said, uh, a teacher educator now, but I have worked in nurse education and various other fields as well. And uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a retrospective, actually, to give you an idea about where we're coming from before we, we find out where we're going. And I think that's going to be useful. Uh, the future, people say I'm daft as a brush, you know, and I suppose I am in some ways. I'm a bit daft, but I'm not daft enough to think that I can predict the future because I can't. And you can't either. Anybody who says they can predict the future is either lying or deluded. Right, think about that because the future is something that's imagined. We don't know what's happening or where we're going. But what we can do is we can look at trends. We can look at what we're doing now and where we've come from. And then hopefully try and project, try and anticipate where we're going with technology. Uh, and uh, then see whether we can anticipate those trends and then prepare for them. Um, here's a picture of a soothsayer. Everyone's got one. This guy... He thinks he can tell the future. Back in the Old Testament times, who knows their Old Testament? Who knows about the prophets in the Old Testament? Anyone? Anyone read the Bible? Back in the Old Testament times, a prophet, if he stood up and prophesied that something would happen, the people would gauge whether he was right or not by whether it did happen. And if it didn't, they'd stone him. He'd be stoned to death. This guy looked a bit stoned already, didn't he, actually? But... Uh, <laughs> but uh, this is what somebody said when they were trying to predict the future back in 1878. So William Priest, who was the chief engineer of the British Post Office, said, The Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. And he was wrong, because messenger boys wasn't the only way to communicate, because the telephone actually opened up a whole new world of possibilities. And each technology as it comes along does the same thing. What about this one, Mary Somerville? Somerville. Tell us you won't last, it's a flash in the pan. Look where she's from, radio educational broadcast. She's got an agenda. So when people predict, predict the future, they've got an agenda usually. Look through, read between the lines and see 
who's funding them or where they're coming from before you realise that maybe they're not actually predicting the future, they're just predicting what they want the future to be. Um, where have we come from? I, I, this is a, an interesting question. Where have you come from? Uh, where have we started in our journey in technology? Well, I'm going to tell you about my, my future um, from my past. This is me in 1965. I was a little angel, you know. Um, but I grew up wanting to be all sorts of things. I wanted to be an astronaut. I said to my teacher, I want to be an astronaut. He said, get realistic, boy. He said, you can't be an astronaut. Only Americans are astronauts. And uh, at the time that was true, but now of course, you know, if you're into science and you're fit enough, you can be an astronaut. Um, that's what I wanted to be, but eventually, of course, um, when I was in school in Holland, in 1971, 70, uh, they took us for a school day trip to Eindhoven, which was about oh, 100 kilometers up the road from where I, where I lived. It took us about three hours to get there. And we went to uh, the Philips Flying Saucer, as it was called, which is now called the Evoluon. And it was, it was shaped like that, still is, it's a, con it's a conference centre now, but at the time it was a museum for technology. And I remember seeing for the first time this, not him, but, but that, you know, um, he looks a bit kind of um, drunk, doesn't he, as well, he looks like he's about to fall asleep. But um, maybe he got stuck in the airport last night. But um, that there is the stuff that we were looking at. We were looking at what, what is now called video conferencing. They had two rooms separated by a corridor and they had a camera and a monitor and a microphone in each. And you could sit in one room and say hello to your mate who was down the corridor. And I thought this is amazing. And at the time Star Trek had come out and all these other tools and technologies. You recognise these? Recognise that one there? Yeah? Recognise it? Yeah? That's the one where if you put it in front of the students they all get high. They float away, you know, the band of spirit duplicator, as it was called. Uh, remember this one? The Ballenhauer 16mm projector. I used to work with all these back in the 70s when I first left school. And this one here, the VHS cassette tape, still using it, says someone down the front there. Yeah. I won't identify them. Um, that one there, the Betamax. Superior by far in quality to the VHS, but it died the death. Several reasons for that. One of the reasons was that all of the rental companies started using VHS because the, um, the people who, who plugged the VHS format wanted it to be superior, so they pushed it through and um, Rediffusion and all these other companies, rent, rental companies, began to um, just stop those tapes. And the other thing was that um, Betamax never carried pornography, whereas VHS did. And there's another factor why it became more popular. All these little things, the little differences, actually, what make technology a success or a failure. Um, recognise these? Anyone recognise the old um, room-sized computers, which you had to program with punched cards or tapes? And there's some of our stewardesses from last night, from Air Fungus. Sorry, Air Lingus. Sorry. No. Um, and and recognise these? The dot matrix printer, the noisy printer. Um, this one here, the BBC computer. Yeah. Um, what's that? The ZX Spectrum, Sinclair. Uh, oh, Space Invaders. Spent many hours wasting my time in the arcades playing that. And CFAX. Don't see that anymore. These are all kind of dead technologies, but they all made an impact at the time. So this is where we've come from. And this is where we're kind of at now with smartphones, touchscreens, satellite technology, and non-touch technologies, the Xbox 360 Connect. Lots of schools are beginning to kind of think about harnessing the power of these technologies now. They're quite exotic still, some of them, and they cost a bit of money, but schools are starting to invest in them. I'm sure some of you here are in schools that are using them now. So that's where we've come from, but can we kind of predict from those trends where we might be heading. Well, we know things are getting smaller, we know things are getting cheaper, we know things are becoming more usable, transparent. Back in 1989, this was the mantra, the future is multimedia, because multimedia would take the classroom and it would bring the world into it. So it would bring the world into the classroom. And so the future was multimedia. But then, about 10 years um, after that, about 99, I was in Berlin on a panel and um, we were being asked then about what the future would be. And they said, Steve, what's the future of education? And at the time I said, it's the web. And I really believed that to be true. And um, of course, 
I knew the trends, I could see where we were going. But I, I couldn't, in my wildest dreams, imagine that everything would converge on the web, so that everything we do now is centered upon the web. You can watch video on the web, you can order your groceries on the web, you can consult physicians on the web. There's so much you can do on the web now um, that it really was the future of the time. Then a couple of years ago, I believed that the future would be smart media, smart mobiles, um, touchscreen mobiles in particular. Because if you think about it, what that does is it flips what we did with multimedia. Multimedia brought the world into the classroom. Smartphones are taking the classroom back out into the world again. Sending students out into the world to be able to do stuff outside the classroom. The walls of the classroom don't matter anymore. The boundaries that we impose don't matter anymore. This goes across curricula as well. This goes across assessment. This goes across evaluation. It goes across everything that we do as teachers. It's breaking down all the walls. And I'll try and give you some examples of that. We're living in exciting times. In fact, um, Ray Kurzweil, who is a futurologist, he, he makes his living by trying to predict trends. He said the, f the future um, is full of change. He says, but the thing is, change is not linear. Change is exponential. And he's right. Um, the change actually goes up in a very, very steep curve. It continues to grow. And it's very difficult to keep up with it, even if you're in the business like I am. So where are we now? Well, there's a lot we can say about where we are now, because we, we're observing the phenomenon of exponential change happening in our classrooms and outside them as well. Um, for instance, look at this. If you stop the internet for 60 seconds, what would you miss? I'll point out some of these for you. And in fact, I've already shared these slides on my slideshare.net um, forward slash teeth site. So you can have a look at this later on. Some of the things you've missed in 60 seconds, 1,500 new blog posts, <coughs> nearly 700,000 search inquiries on Google alone. Up the top there, 1,000, sorry, 370,000 minutes worth of voice calls on Skype. Here's a really telling one for you. Only one new paper-based article is published every minute, and that's declining. Journals, chapters in books, magazine articles, paper-based print is declining. I'm not going to say it's going to be the death of it, but I'm saying it's declining because of the increase, the exponential increase in all these other things. And there are others up there which you could also say are quite phenomenal as well, but I'm going to move on because we're running out of time. Here is the social media use, and I would say that this is what it actually causes all of the previous stuff to, to happen. Uh, people are, are um, flocking to these tools. You've heard of Facebook, you've heard of Tumblr, no doubt, which is a type of blogging service. Uh, MySpace is another um, lesser known, but probably precursed Facebook, lesser known social media site. Twitter, you probably know about now, if you're not on it already, get on because it's a phenomenal tool for connecting with a huge personal learning network out there, which you can create. Over 200 million users already active on there. LinkedIn, that's a professional site. Who's actually a, a, a member of LinkedIn? Quite a few of you. Who's a member of Twitter? Even more. What about Facebook? About the same, maybe, maybe even more still. So you can see the popularity of these tools. And what you use them for is, 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 is multifarious. There's lots of different ways that you can use them. Uh, Wikipedia, over 14 million articles on Wikipedia. That's just in English. You don't forget that there are hundreds of other languages where you've also got millions of articles appearing on Wikipedia as well. Flickr, over four billion images currently uh, being um, housed on Flickr. And finally, YouTube, this is an astounding one, over 24 hours of video every minute being loaded up onto that site. As teachers, we cannot afford to ignore this anymore. We cannot afford to just gloss it over and say, oh well, it doesn't happen. There are huge potentials there for us to exploit. A lot of it's rubbish, but in amongst it all you'll find gold nuggets. Things that you can repurpose and use for your own, the children in your own class. So we've got a huge potential here to harness and exploit. 
Here's something which I've um, put together which represents some of Ken Robinson's ideas. In a book uh, last year, Out of Our Minds, he wrote about how you can compress down 3,000 years of time into 24 hours. What would it look like in terms of technology? And only 11 minutes ago, if that happens, you've got the Gutenberg printing press appearing. 25 seconds ago, the World Wide Web appeared. And only one second ago, 3D television. Who's got a 3D television? Oh, yeah. Put your hand up. You wanted to. Some reluctantly, you're putting your hands up. In case anyone wants to come round, you yeah. <laughs> have a look. Yeah. It's rare, rare technology at the moment, but nevertheless, these are trends that we're looking at here. Yeah. And I'll show you some more that we think are happening. Um, this one here, it's quite an interesting picture. This is Glastonbury, but it's representative of tribal behaviour. You notice the flags behind, you notice the way that people dress, you notice the way they talk with each other. Um, they, they identify with each other because you want to belong to a group, you want to have a, a belonging sense. Um, so this is why people, when they try to show affinity to each other, they, they try to posture, postural echo each other. They, they stand in the same way, or they put their, their hands on their hips in the same way, or they nod together. And you, you see this kind of behaviour happening, and we see it happening on the web as well. We see tribal behaviour happening. Um, I, I like to think of Facebook and Flickr and YouTube as digital totems around which the tribes gather. If you think about it, the tribes behave differently. So on Facebook, for instance, the, the digital tribes on Facebook are actually connecting with people that they know fairly well, friends or relatives or family or colleagues. And they represent themselves with their real names usually and with real pictures. On Flickr, it's a different matter. So the Flickrite tribe, they gather around pictures as their totems. And they don't use their real names usually. And they have a pseudonym as well. And they don't know each other. But you see, they still connect. It's a different type of connection, different type of tribal behaviour. And whichever behaviour, whether it's the Wikipedians that you see, you know, they've all got different tribal behaviours happening. Have a look and see what you think. So um, another thing we, we see a lot of is this user-generated content, which I mentioned earlier on. User-generated content is one of the biggest, fastest growing areas on the web. It's huge. People blogging, people podcasting, people shoving up videos onto YouTube and, and so on. Uh, our students are doing this all the time without us even knowing about it. They're doing it extracurricularly. We're seeing more mobile personalised learning. This is a really vital one to consider. And no matter how much we try and ban things like mobile phones in the classroom, kids will still use them. They'll use them under the table, they'll use them surreptitiously. If you confiscate them, they'll get another one. You can't stop it. And the things that they're doing online, using these tools, often they're Facebooking each other or putting status updates up, but also sometimes they'll be checking out what you're saying. Make sure that you're telling the truth, that you're accurate, that you're relevant. And that can be quite threatening to some teachers, I think. But that's what they'll be doing. Can you see the screen okay with the, uh, with the light on it? Is it all right? Yeah. I'll, I'll just go and um, tell the sun to go away. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, there's another thing that um, I think we should know. Marshall McLuhan said, we shape our tools and then thereafter our tools shape us. Now forget the idea that tools are neutral because they're not. Richard Clark for years has been saying tools are neutral, they're just mere vehicles that deliver the learning to us. Actually, it's more than that. If you, if you look at the affordances of these technologies, if you look at our perceptions of what they can do for us, it's actually very different to being neutral. They are charged with meaning, they are charged with nuances, and the tools begin to shape our behaviour the more we use them. There's a societal shift going on. This picture here, this is um, a news release. This actually says Amazon.com is now selling more Kindle books than print books. That came out on May the 19th, 2011. That's, that's almost a year old. And the trend increases all the time. Kindle is selling more now than, um, than, than print books on Amazon. That's an interesting statistic. Another one. Nokia celebrates 1.5 billion phones running on S40, which is a, a standard. Mobile phones are on the increase. There are almost as many mobile phones now in the world as there are people. I go to very poor countries as part of my job. I went to the Gambia. Anyone know where the Gambia is? Western Africa, one of the poorest nations in Africa. 
Most of, the, most of the houses there, and none of the schools, hardly any of the schools, have got electricity, let alone resources. But everybody's got a mobile phone. Because that's how they communicate. That's how they find work. That's how they find food. Um, it's another trend that I think we're seeing an exponential rise in. And one final one here. This is about games playing. And there are lots of statistics there about how girls are catching up with boys on games playing, particularly video games and digital um, media and so on. So the, the genders are equalizing out as well. So we're seeing trends in all directions here which are exponential. And here's an image from Malik Kuros' slides set, which he graciously gave me permission to, to use today. Um, the average digital birth of children happens at about six months. In other words, the parents create a Facebook page for them at around about six months, sometimes less. In Canada, USA, UK, France, Italy, Germany and Spain, 81% of children under the age of two have some kind of digital profile or footprint. They come into your classes already digital citizens. Think about that. What are their expectations from you as a teacher? It's a sobering thought that we have to all consider very seriously. This is what they do. They consume data at a huge rate. They produce data. They remix it. They share it. They're doing all these things and we can assume from that that learning is changing because they are becoming much more involved, they're becoming more proactive, they're becoming more discerning in the way that they're using the content that they find on the web and elsewhere. This is, this is another trend that we're seeing emerging. It's changing their literacies as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. I don't know if you've seen this picture before. Anyone tell me what it is? Well, shout it out. Don't be shy. It's Obama. There he is down the bottom here. Um, he's, this is one of his, uh, that's his kind of hymn sheet he's, he's singing from. But can you see what the crowd are doing? This is in Berlin, by the way, before he got elected. You see? They're taking pictures. They're all doing that. And John at the back just held his laptop up, which is exactly what this guy's doing here. Like he's live streaming it on a laptop. Yeah. And what they're doing is, it's ubiquitous connection. The whole of the world's media was there, but that didn't matter because the people that were there wanted to connect with people they knew elsewhere. So what they were doing was taking pictures and videos and sending it direct to the people that they knew who were friends of theirs or family or loved ones and saying to them, look, I'm here. I'm within touching distance of the guy. It's happening. I'm, I'm making history. This is the kind of thing we see more and more happening all the time. We see it with citizen journalism, for instance, reporting from war zones as it happens. Uh, so news is actually circumventing the major media channels. We knew that Michael Jackson had died four hours before the BBC did. They knew, but they were having to verify it. But Twitter was putting it out there. And 200 million people knew about that before most of the world did, because Twitter was more immediate. And there's a picture of a close-up of them holding up their cameras. Here's what we're seeing with the infrastructure of the web. This is my interpretation of Nova Spivak's work. Um, if you can imagine that Web 1 is what we used to do, this is the sticky web as they call it, which is the web that you couldn't change. It was the first version that came out in the mid-90s, early 90s. And this was really a kind of a, a first stab at the web. What we're seeing at the moment is a lot of Web 2 based stuff, as Tim O'Reilly calls it. That's a false distinction, really, but we're seeing an evolution towards social based um, computing. But we're also seeing an evolution towards information based computing as well, what we call the semantic web, Web 3. The trajectory we really have to hit is this one here, which, we, which takes us up to what I'm calling Web X points theory, or the meta web. And if you think about it, this is what we do with them. First one connects information, the second one connects people. The third one connects knowledge. That's what we're doing now to a limited extent. The fourth one is going to connect intelligence. It's going to predict what we want to do before we even know we want to do it. We're seeing an early emergence of this already through things like recommender systems and intelligent filtering. Things like the Amazon book show, bookcase, when you go into it, you, you order a book. And it says, oh, did you know 26 people ordered that book, also ordered this book? And you go, ooh, I didn't know about that one. And you suddenly want a book that you didn't even know you wanted. It's great marketing, but it's also 
an intelligent system because what it's doing is it's predicting your behavior and thinking it knows what you want next because of a crowdsourced um, measurement of, of what other people want who are similar to you. If you go onto Facebook and you type in something of, uh, I'm going to Spain on holiday, suddenly on the right hand side in the next refreshment of that screen you'll get lots of um, images and adverts about Spain because it's monitoring what you're doing. It's intelligent now. And what it's doing is it's connecting that intelligence more and more. Now think of the potential of this in education. This is the way we're, we're heading. We know this is happening because we're seeing the evidence of it. And here's some other kind of uh, mapping of that, looking at um, uh, the future where um, the user is actually, the consumer is actually increasing their input, whereas the, 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 the normal producers would be reducing their input. The web is now firmly in the hands of the people. It's beyond the, the control of most companies and most governments. And uh, if I just show you some of the tools that we see in these different phases. So listservs would have been in the first phase, wikis and blogs second phase. We're, we're going into intelligent collaborative filtering, smart media devices and onwards. And we're, we're looking at adaptive technologies now. We're looking at intelligent agents. All of these things are in the future, but they're already beginning to emerge and put their heads above the parapet for us to look at. So this is, this is how exciting it is. Um, I want to move on away from the technology and start talking about thinking, talking about learning now. So I'd like to talk about creative thinking for a minute, and get us thinking, and then we'll move back towards the future in a minute. I want to tell you a story about this little dog here. You can go, ah, at this point. Because this is the ah, this is the cute factor, all right? And this little dog, a chihuahua, okay, there's a story about this dog, bear with me. Um, apparently this dog went on holiday with his owner and they went to, on a safari holiday to Africa. The dog was very intelligent but he was also um, very headstrong. And uh, you might recognise someone from there, I don't know, but uh, someone in your family maybe or in your class, but he was headstrong and intelligent, they seemed to go hand to hand. He ran away from his owner out into the bush and got lost. But he didn't care because he was enjoying himself and looking around, sniffing around. And suddenly, in the distance, he saw this big hungry lion coming towards him. And he had nowhere to run. He knew he was in trouble. So what did he do? He looked around, saw a pile of bones on the floor and started gnawing them. And as the lion got closer, he shouted out in a loud voice, That was a great, really tasty lion. I wonder if there's any more around here. And the lion stopped, because it was a stupid lion, right? And it slinked away back into the jungle and then walked away thinking, oh, that was a lucky escape. That evil little dog almost had me there. Now, the end, that's not the end of the story, because there was a monkey in the tree, and the monkey saw this happen. And he looked at this, the, the, the clever dog, and he looked at the stupid lion and thought, well, the lion's more powerful. I'm going to try and curry some favour with the lion. So he went off and he found the lion, and he said to the lion, um, did you know that that little dog made a fool out of you? He wasn't really eating the bones, he just saw them there. You know? And the lion got really angry and said, right, that's it, I'm going to kill that dog now. Come back on my back, monkey, and let me show you what I do to my enemies. And the stupid lion and the monkey walked all the way back, and the dog saw them coming again and thought quickly, looked down at the pile of the bones again and said, no, I've sent that monkey away to find me another lion. I wonder why he's taking so long. <laughs> this is the kind of thinking that we need to instill in our, our, our young people. It's, it's about creativity, it's about problem solving, it's about negotiating meaning, it's about being agile in your, in your way of interpreting problems. It's about all those things and more. How do we get them to absorb that? Well, and let me tell you, one thing we will not be able to do is to just push content at them. That will not help them to think critically, that will not help them to reflect on practice, that will not help them to be agile thinkers or creative learners. All it will do is it will bombard them with content and then we'll have a problem because that's all that they will give back to you is the content. Um, Martin and Celia, a couple of Scandinavian theorists back in the 70s came up with this wonderful simple diagram about learning. The idea that we have surface approaches to learning and we have deep approaches to learning but most students if they are wise become strategic learners and they switch between the two. And so, for instance, when they're cramming for an exam, 
they learn surface-wise and they just get the facts into their head, ready to regurgitate them. Whereas if they want to problem solve, they go much deeper than that. And you can put a, a kind of a computer model onto this if you like, and you can show that data becomes information, becomes knowledge, becomes wisdom, becomes transformation. And it's that one that we're interested in, the really deep learning. How do we instill that within our learners? How do we get students to, to go down deeper through that superficial learning into the deeper learning? Well, here's a, another model for you. If you imagine those three things, knowledge, wisdom, transformation, as a sequence, and then you think, okay, knowledge is knowing that, it's all about facts. So it's, it's very declarative, it, you can say it. You don't have to invest that much energy into it. Whereas wisdom, it's much more about knowing how. It's, it's about the procedures, the skills. It's about being able to apply that knowledge in a deeper way. And finally, transformation is knowing why you do it. It's about the critical aspects. And if you recognize on the right hand side that that's Bloom's taxonomy, you're doing very well. This is where we come from, this is where we're going in terms of new pedagogies. We have to think about the process that we're going through and the process we're taking young people through. Uh, here's an example of that, the tomato. <laughs> Um, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing you don't put it in a fruit salad. Right? And criticality is knowing the reason why you don't put it in a fruit salad even though it's a fruit. Okay? It's these kind of thinking processes that we, we need to try and instill within our young people. To make them available and to make them prepared for a world of work that we cannot even clearly describe yet. We don't know what's going to be around in, in three years' time when they leave school or whatever. All we can do is prepare them for what we think is going to be there. We might be hopelessly wrong. So the best thing we can do is to help them become agile thinkers, creative problem solvers. That's the best thing that they can learn. And, and they can learn how to learn then, of course, rather than learning facts and just knowledge. Another thing that we're seeing happening, let's go back onto the technology trends for a minute, is convergence, things joining together. So here's an example, Dual View TV. Um, you and your missus or your husband, you might fight over the TV channel you want to watch. She might want to watch the rugby, and he might want to watch a cookery program. All right, so who wins? Well, whoever's got the remote control, of course, that's who wins. But Dual TV is coming out now. Has anyone seen this? Is anyone familiar with this? What happens is it works off the basis of two people wearing spectacles and it switches rapidly between the two. You have both images on the screen at once but you only see one depending on which pair of spectacles you're wearing. Think about the pedagogical aspects of that if you had that in a classroom. Uh, gamification. It's not about video games. It's about gamifying learning. It's about taking the rules and the excitement of games into any learning situation. That's becoming very popular now in some schools and I think that's going to be on the increase as well because it's effective. It engages learners and it gives them fun while they're learning. I know fun isn't the important thing but the fun of the learning actually makes the learning deeper because they want to repeat the experience. They want to go deeper and they want to compete as well as collaborate. Um, this is what Graham Baird Martin said about um, gamification. When we play games, we rapidly solve abstract problems in real time while being continually assessed and often working collaboratively. Isn't that the kind of stuff that is transferable as a set of skills to enable young people to thrive in, a, in a, an uncertain future? I think it is. I think he's nailed it there. Yet yeah, we have to temper that what Liz Corcoran said. She's at um, I think Harvard University. She said gamification is creating an expectation among people that real life interactions follow simple mechanics. And there's plenty of disillusionment when they don't. So gamification can simplify learning. Um, but it also has that problem as well. We have to temper these things. We have to be critical and think both sides of the equation. Social media and learning, I think, are going to be important. Um, but I think that they're going to converge with email. I think we're seeing evidence of this. So for instance, if you look at Fluent, which is one of several recent um, innovations where email services are now um, taking the best of email and ditching the worst of it and bringing in the best of social media as well. 
this is an example, but this is one that you can actually, it's in beta form now, so you can go in and uh, into Fluent and actually um, try it out for yourself. It's fluent.io, I think is the, the URL there. Have a look at that one and see whether email is going to change in the future. Um, learning 2.0. It's all about those tools, but ultimately it's about this. Going back full circle, it's about what the student creates. And many of my student groups now are going off and creating the content. All I do is I stand there for five or ten minutes at the start of a lesson and I say to them, look, here's a demonstration or here's an idea for you, here's a trigger material for you, here's some stimulus. And then I send them away and they actually create the content themselves. Um, I may task them to go away and create a, 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 a two minute video or a podcast or create a wiki space or, or go and blog about it. And then they come back after they've done their research and they have to present what they've done and then defend it against criticism, against the weaknesses. And of course that has a whole series of learning processes within it, embedded within it. Twitter in the classroom, I know there was a session on this this morning, I'm, sadly I missed it, but um, if you can imagine that Twitter is all these things, it's a library to start with. It sounds simple, but it's, it's actually a very complex tool. It's a street corner. It's where you can talk with people from around the world. It's where you can connect into huge, uh, powerful learning networks with real experts who have written books on this subject. My students were, were amazed when I said to them, look, go and twit, follow this guy on Twitter. And they came back the following week and said, we've read his book and yet he's answering our questions. Can't believe that that man who wrote, wrote that book and we're reading it as part of our certain meeting, reading. He's actually answering our questions direct. He's talking to us personally. I couldn't believe it. It's a soapbox. You can do a rant on it. You can get comments back. You can have a discussion. You can have a debate, an argument. We learn from those things. But it's also amplification of other ideas as well. So tweeting and retweeting in itself is a process of amplifying ideas across large communities. Uh, this is what my students said when we started getting them to use Twitter. Some of the things they said. This guy down here. Twitter has opened up a wealth of opportunities and information I never knew even knew existed. To be honest, I might have to blog about it now. <laughs> and he did. This is blog down there. jcbarrington.blogspot.com John Sheffield, I'll mention him because he's uh, a bright guy. He's going to go far. He's still in his teacher training, but he's already got a huge following on Twitter and on his blog. And of course that spurs him on because he's got an audience now. He wants to write more. He wants to improve his writing. He wants to be more grammatically correct. He wants to reference more appropriately. He wants to send messages out there which he gets comments back from. It's a huge motivation for him and so many other of our students as well. And there's a few others here as well. Twitter, we're better connected. Pretty much sums it up for me, says Alex. We've now teaching in a primary school somewhere in the south of England. So it's having an impact. Here's another thing that's having an impact. The idea of curating, digital curation. This is Scoopit, scoop.it. There's also Pearl Trees, there's also Storify, there's quite a few of them. And what they do is they allow you to find content and then aggregate it together. And here's the powerful bit. It also allows you to annotate it, put your own message on the end of it, your own meaning, and then present it as a magazine style website. Very simple to use. Try it out and see what you think. Scoop.it. That's my future school, Scoop It. Has thousands of followers already. Another future that we need to look at. Are we open or closed? Are we going to stay uh, closed or are we going to be open? Who's open here? Who's closed? Who's in the middle? Who's deciding whether the content that you create is going to be shared for free? Um, the future is all about sharing, I think. It's all about openness. I put a CC license, I don't know if you can see it here, a Creative Commons license on every one of the slides that I create. I also put it on all my blogs, posts. And that means that not only can you use it for free, you can also repurpose it if you want. You can take chunks out of it and use them in your own lessons. Uh, one of my slideshows recently, I put it up, I think it was this one actually, one similar to this. I spoke in London two weeks ago and uh, afterwards I put my slideshow up. Within two days it had had 18,000 views. Uh, two weeks later or three weeks later it's had over 36,000 views. 
And not only is it being viewed by lots of people, they are commenting on it. And I'm, I'm reading their comments and I'm responding to them, I'm having conversations about the content, and about whether I'm right or wrong, or, or whether they're right or wrong, and we're having great debates about it. And not only that, but because it's under repurposing license and they can do it without asking my permission, it means that they can translate it into other languages as well. Several of my blog posts and slideshows have been translated, for instance, into Spanish, which means that it opens up a whole new audience for me in South America. Millions of people read it who wouldn't be able to read it otherwise. This is the part of the exponential change we're talking about with the web. Another one here. Touch or no touch future. Will your grandchildren in 20 years time say to you, granddad, grandma, did you really have to touch your computer to make it work? Um, I could show you a video here actually, I don't know if this will work or not, but I'll show you a bit of this video. I know we're going to be running out of time soon, but I'll, this is an amazing video. I hope the sound is okay on it. I'll only show you a piece of this. You can watch the rest of it later yourself. stop at that point. Everything you saw there already exists and more. Um, that's the touch future. We're already seeing evidence of this in front of iPads and iPods and you know, iPhones and so on and, and uh, other, other touch screen technologies. It's going to be built though into the walls of things very soon for some people and quickly as people buy into it price will come down, the economies of scale will increase and therefore it will be manufactured more. These kind of things I think will also be in our future. Now how you harness those in the classroom is going to be important I think as well. Um, back to the slides again. You've seen the Xbox 360 Connect. Who's actually used one? So you know that it has the ability to determine where you are in relation to the room and in relation to other people. It uses two different cameras. It's also got voice activation on it as well. And the next version will actually determine millions of body positions, not just hundreds of thousands. So therefore, it will um, understand where your fingers are as well, not just where your hands are. And we're getting more sophisticated with this as we go on. This is a way of interacting with space to, to allow um, certain tools to respond to your command. It's like the minority report of Tom Cruise, you know, throwing these pictures around by just moving his gauntlets around in space. Um, this is MIT's Sixth Sense device. Another short video. Um, this is Pranav Mystery, who was the inventor of this, demonstrating this at a TED talk recently. <laughs> You can start using any surface, any wall around you as an interface. The camera is actually tracking all your gestures, whatever you are doing with your hands, is understanding that gesture. And actually, I'll tell you what I'll do. Some color markers that in the beginning I will stop that. And I'll say to you, look for 
Pranav Mystery, the MIT Sixth Sense wearable, and have a look at the video and see what you think of it. Because what it does is, it, it, through a combination of using a, a projector and a camera and a connection to internet and a mirror, you can project onto any surface. And anything you're searching for on the, on the web can be manipulated with just four fingers. You can make a, a, a picture sign like that and take a picture through your hand. And it will, will recognise the, the gestures. It's a gestural device. Uh, again, I think this is going to be part of our future. The non-touch technologies. We've got to decide the, how the web meets the world. We've got to decide what the interface is going to be and what we want to do with it. How do we want to harness this for our learners? One or two final thoughts for you before I finish. Um, the Internet of Things. Things that are connected to the Internet. You saw a fridge in the previous video that was connected to the Internet. Um, the Internet of Things involves things that you recognise already. This is connected to the Internet because it recognises what you buy in the supermarket. And the next time you go online to buy things, it'll offer them to you again. Because it's got a record of it. So your loyalty card has more than one function. Mm -hmm. Think about that too. Um, there's the fridge I was talk talking to you about. Um, in Japan, for instance, they have these fridges which allow you to, um, to forget about what you order. It orders it for you. It notices when the milk is finished or it's out of date uh, because of the bar barcodes on it and then it will order more for you and it'll just arrive. Um, there are toilets which tell the doctor that you're ill even before you know it. <laughs> you know, in Japan. All these things exist already. Um, there's a Frisian herd of cattle in Denmark. Every one of those cattle has an embedded chip within them which measures things like fat ratio and health, um, the, the miles that the cow walks during a day, how much food it eats and so on. And every one of those cows sends back around about 20 megabytes of information to the farmer's computer every year. And finally, um, cars uh, with all sorts of onboard computer equipment. And these are just the, the start of what we think is going to be the Internet of Things. A lot more will appear as the years go by. This is what learners are, are, are doing with all this. They're more self-directed. They're, they're more oriented towards being their own means of production. They're creating stuff themselves without asking, without being asked to do it now. Um, they're more inclined to collaborate with each other because they're, they're always connected. But that's not enough. They need more than that. I promised some people today that I'd talk about digital literacies and, and what it means for me. They need digital wisdom. They need to know that everything they find on Wikipedia is not true. They need to know that everything they find on the internet is not necessarily right or correct, accurate. They need to be discerning. This is where, where it starts. So they need to know this, for instance. I show my learners this, and I say, what's wrong with it? And they go, they go, oh, is it 70%? <laughs> or uh, maybe that's not Thomas Edison, and then of course I tell them he died many, many years before the internet was even created. So they go, oh, they need these literacies. They need to be able to discern. They don't, you, they don't need to be able to swallow everything whole. They need to be thinking about things. They need to be actively involved with learning. And here's another thing I think someone mentioned earlier, I think it was Catherine Cronin mentioned earlier on, nice, nice uh, presentation from Catherine earlier on, about the idea of managing your identity. What happens if one of my students has a picture taken of them falling out of a pub at three o'clock in the morning, and then it gets posted to, to um, Facebook and tagged, and then three or four years later when they go for a job, the head teacher thinks, oh, I'll Google them, and finds their Facebook page and finds a picture of them like that. Will they offer them an interview, let them in a job? It's no good saying, oh, well, I'll just delete the, the photograph from Facebook. It's still there. It's still searchable. Things don't just disappear when you delete them. We're too naive with the internet to believe this. They need awareness of e-safety. They need awareness of how they manage their identities. All of these things, I think, are going to be important for learners in the future. And I talk about literacies rather than skills because I want to just make a difference here. I want to tell you what the difference is. Uh, this is a picture of um, looking out through a windscreen of a car driving in the desert in America. Um, I like to 
give it this way, I like to, to try and present it this way, that when you learn to drive, and you're very sensible in this country, you drive on the left-hand side of the road. Yeah. It's like we do in England. When you learn to drive, you learn to drive on the left, you learn to drive using particular signs and the particular sequences and so on. When you go to America, there's certain things you have to learn again. What happens when four cars appear at a crossroads at the same time? I've tried it and I've been beat for my troubles because I've gone in the wrong sequence. There's a certain set of nuances that you have to learn, a set of social mores. There are certain things that you need to learn again when you're in a different culture. And literacies for me are about being able to take your skills, whatever they are, and apply them differently to different cultures and different contexts. That's why they need literacies, because the, the, the landscape of the web is changing all the time. Um, here's some of the literacies that we've identified. There are many, many others. This is not exhaustive. But they need to be able to self-present. They need to be able to organize and create content. They need to be able to manage their identity, as we've said. They need to be able to understand what reusing and repurposing is. That you don't go on the internet and copy anything, because you must assume that if it's on the internet, it's not copyright free. And if you take it and use it, you could be sued. You need to look for things like the CC Creative Commons license to know whether you can use something for free or not. These are all the literacies they need to use and need to learn. Um, here's Socrates. Knowledge that is acquired under compulsion obtains no hold on the mind, said Socrates. Why are you laughing? Oh, sorry, it's the wrong Socrates, isn't it? Right. Actually, it wasn't Socrates that said that anyway, it was Plato. <laughs> Alright? I better change the picture, haven't I? That's Plato. Actually, no, it's not. That's Socrates. <laughs> Got it wrong again. That's Plato. So, what I've done there is I've just reiterated, I've just you know, made mistakes and, and, and corrected them. And that's exactly what you see happening on Wikipedia. And we call it Darwinism. The survival of the fittest content. It's exactly what you see happening. Reiteration, reiteration, changing, changing, deletion, exclusion, re, re, you know, re, reappraising and so on. And eventually, of course, you get what we've got here on Wikipedia now. Crowdsourcing evaluation. Bottom of each Wikipedia page now, you've got four things. You, you give it how many stars you think it's trustworthy, how many stars you think it's objective, complete, well written. And at the bottom, you click to say whether you're knowledgeable of that, of that area or not. And that way that they can tell how accurate those pages are and how they need to be improved. This is happening all over the web as we begin to realise that the web is a free-for-all and we need to start managing the quality control of it. Another trend. I'm going to finish off with one of your famous sons. I admire this man greatly. I wish I'd been around when he was around. I'd probably be dead now. But, uh, but you know, if he was alive now, this is the kind of stuff that he would be coming out with. Education is not the filling of a pail. It's about the lighting of a fire. And I challenge all of us as teachers to make the difference because it's not the tools or the technology that inspires young people. It's not the content or the curriculum that inspires young people. It's not even the assessments and the examinations that we impose upon them, the testing. That doesn't inspire young people. It's you. The teacher that inspires young people. That's why you're a teacher. Thank you very much. Well, that is certainly some capstone, isn't it? Today we started off with a very, very exciting uh, presentation by Stephen. Got us all going, got us all thinking. We laughed quite a bit, but there was an awful lot of learning going on. Throughout the day today, we have been enriched, challenged, learning of a whole load of new and exciting things. Tools, thoughts, etc. to help us and to focus us in their teaching. And in a wonderful way, I think life has played a very good trick on us by delaying you, Steve, because we have come now to a bringing together and a contextualising of all that we have been learning and involved in learning today. And I think we have to thank him for that, because in a way, unbeknownst to himself, he pulled all the things that we have and we've been doing today together. 
and focused us for going forward because at the end of the day, as he said, it is us as the teachers, whether as our persons in ourselves or the decisions we make about how we do things, what we're going to bring into that classroom that is ultimately the influencing factor. So again, could I ask you to put your hands together for Steve.